to plot or not to plot? No. To part, <laughs> to plot or not to plot? Part two. Production value is going to increase incrementally in this. So don't be waiting for great leaps ahead in that. Let's talk about the case study and why it's valuable. The case study is a specific example of somebody trying to get something done. So yesterday when we did plot or not to plot, we talked about lots of different ways of thinking about it, conceptualizing it, the difference between facing structural problems like a heist versus uh, uh, a different kind of drama, like interpersonal relationship and a marriage falling apart. We talked about different writers and their approaches to it and uh, why it is that there isn't an answer to this, but rather different strategies that do different things. Now it's time to go from the meta theory right down to some kind of practice. Why? Because the act of writing is an art. And art means, in this case, that the same methods will not yield the same results in other people. No matter what anybody teaches you about writing, doesn't matter, you will never write a John Irving novel. Only John Irving will write a John Irving novel. You will never write a Margaret Atwood novel. You will never write a Siri Hustvelt novel. Siri Hustvelt and Paul Auster live together, and they do not write each other's novels, even though they know everything about each other, one presumes. So you're going to have to write your own novel. There, there, there's no one else can write it for you. And what you produce will have similarities to everything else. Ostensibly, it will have a beginning, middle, and an end, although even that's open for some measure of discussion, and you can argue with Aristotle about that. But what you need to do then is recognize that the craft is going to yield different results for different kinds of people. So let's talk about the plot not to plot problematic and how it is I faced it in one particular uh, circumstance, which was my novel Norwegian by Night. Norwegian by Night started off with a character, a setting, a vague sense of a kind of problem that I wanted to ha uh, address, and a lot of themes that were on my mind. So, Sheldon Horowitz, the 82-year-old Jewish-American, ex-Marine, watch repairman, was not a character that I thought up for Norwegian by Night. He was a minor character in an unpublished manuscript that I wrote in 2003. Norwegian by Night was completed in 2008. The problem with my three or four previous full manuscripts of other stories. And there were many problems because you, you learn, and I'd probably written somewhere between 500,000, 700,000 words by that, by the time I turned to Norwegian by Night, which is what taught me how to do this. One of the main problems I had was that my main characters were boring. My main characters were indecisive, they were milk toast. They were, they lacked dynamism. They didn't have a sense of humor. It was like they were paralyzed by, by their own spotlight. My secondary characters, however, were fantastic. They were funny and, and they made bold, big decisions and old statements and it's as though for some reason because they were in the background playing the tree um, they were able to, to, to yuck it up and have a really good time and I'm not going to bother going to psychotherapy to figure out why that was the case but I, re I realized it was the case and Sheldon was a really great character in that failed piece of 
work that I had produced. And so I decided I was going to elevate him and I was going to make him my main character. And I was going to see whether I could maintain the energy, whether he could make the transition to the spotlight and still be himself or whether I would screw him up. Because the problem is that I'm the one holding the spotlight and the spotlight had some magical power that squishes every character who steps into it. I just didn't know. But I knew that that was worth knowing and was worth spending the time on. There are also some other things going on in my mind, uh, in my life, and were on my mind at the time. One was that my, my grandparents had passed away and I was extremely close to them. They more or less raised me. Um, my son was born, Julian. And so being a father in fatherhood was very much on my mind. And my wife, Camilla, who's Norwegian, we were thinking about moving from Geneva, Switzerland, which is where we were living at the time, and moving to Norway, which we thought might be nice to have a family up there. And I needed a break from Geneva. I'd been there long enough and it was driving me crazy. And uh, so we were going to go to Norway. And I was thinking about Norway and I was thinking about my grandparents' generation. Uh, I was thinking about being a father. I was thinking about being Jewish. I was thinking about being Jewish in Norway. I was thinking about my, all, all these, they're themes. They're just, they're, 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 they're topics that seize the mind at the time. And I felt that somehow within that space, there might be a story to find. But there was no story yet. But there was a character and there was a place and there were thematics and there was a mood and there was a cluster of, of relationships and possibilities that I thought might have space. I knew I needed to do two things. I needed a driving, bigger, larger than life main character. And I also needed a much more simple, straightforward story than I had ever written before. My stuff was really complicated. I mean, it was, you know, if you were to map it out, it would have, it would have, you know, circles and arrows and a paragraph in the back. Each one explain what each one was as the, as the song goes. Um, Alice's Restaurant. And this time, I, my model for Norwegian by Night was the movie Chinatown. And the line was, just find the girl. Bottom line, Chinatown, as great a movie as it was, was about one thing. Just find the girl. Here come my kids. Can I show you something? Sure, except I'm making a movie. Can can you show me later? Okay, one, well, you can come in, say hello. Hi. Yes, hello. Can you show me very quickly? I'm making a movie right now. Uh, you, if you do lots of things, then then you get the stars because it's lots of different um, math questions you have to do, and it's lots of different ones in. It's ten that you have to do in one, and I've done all of these. And sometimes you get marks, and um, and and I have lots. See how many marks I have. You've done very well so far. Congratulations. Are you going to still do it, or are you finished for the day? I'm still. Keep going. Show me later. Thank you. Thank you. Listen, this is just how it is. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to edit that out. It's Coronaville. We're all stuck here and we're all having to do this. Um, so Norwegian by night. I'm going to keep this at 20 minutes. We're at nine minutes now. I had all these things going on in my head and I wanted to write and I was going to dive into that next book, but I needed to come up with a Chinatown style through line that would allow me to not lose the sense of story I was writing so that the reader would never be fundamentally wondering what's going on, why am I reading this, am I getting anywhere? I don't want, I mean, in a sense, I wanted all those questions to, to disappear or to never show up in the first place, ideally, because you just feel that sense of movement and, and, and progression and that, that page turning sense of, of, of wonder that you get from any book that you enjoy. 
and it doesn't matter if there's nothing in a sense going on in the book the person could just want a glass of water as kurt vonnegut once said doesn't matter it doesn't matter what the book is about it matters whether or not you want to know what's going to happen next and whether you're turning the page whatever is whatever is driving you to keep going so norwegian by night instead of find the girl for me it was save the boy if in fact if you can get your story down to three words it's not reductionist it just gives you your basic line that you will remember my story is about saving the boy saving the boy where norwegian by night became more sophisticated was that there was a second uh well hand i guess there's a second hand there's this hand and then there's this hand this hand goes forward in time so here's here's then and here's the future okay past future save the boy do, 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 do. we're going to save the boy while sheldon's trying to save the boy as his body is physically moving forward in space and time to save the little boy that he is trying to rescue from the the balkan mafia there's also him reconciling the fact that he couldn't save his son and we're the some of the very first thing we learn about his son saul is that he's dead so saul's story is over we're going back in time in this part of the story from his death to saul's birth the book is about sheldon's relationship with his son and he is trying to save this child because he was unable to save this child that's what the book is about the fact that it was pitched and and marketed and awarded as a crime novel is neither here nor there to me that's helped me sell it helped me get published um um the crime people i met they're not the crime people but the, the crime writers i met in that that journey particularly in britain have been some of the most wonderful thoughtful generous people i've ever met it's weird because they kill people for a living and yet they're so nice they really are um and they they took me in and they really liked the book and people said wonderful things i mean i you know i uh val mcdermott um, mark billingham uh, thomas enger i i don't know there's lots and lots of re really really nice people so um i now had a central character that i loved and i knew what his problematic was and i knew where i wanted to start which was basically getting possession of this kid right uh and i knew where i i wanted it to end i didn't know where i wanted it to end with a little balkan kid paul but i do i did know where i wanted it to end on this one which is which was with the birth of his son and i wanted sheldon's story to be a comma tragic event it was also going to be a very jewish story the greeks really separated comedy and tragedy uh and tragedy was venerated comedy came later there's a wonderful story about it which i don't remember but about how and I'll, i'm going to look it up and i'm going to use it in a different uh video but how comedy had to be argued of as being of value to perform for the greeks because uh tragedies were anchored on uh known stories whereas comedies needed to be created and therefore were more frivolous in some ways but in any event i don't think judaism ever really accepted that greek distinction between comedy and tragedy i don't think i don't think it's it's separate mel, mel brooks once said something on the lines of a person a man walking down the street tripping and breaking his ankle is tragic a man walking down the street and falling in a manhole and dying is comedy um we can have all sorts of theoretical discussions about what the act of elevation of of tragedy into comedy not into farce but into funny how that works and there's obviously something there i'm not going to argue with mel brooks um although i will steal from him liberally it it's but i knew so i knew a lot of things about this book so what does all, all this come down to when it comes to plot versus not plot well 
going back to the sailing metaphor, here's a port and here's another port or harbor, harbor, harbors. I don't know. I don't know. So, and I'm over here in my little boat and over here is another one, uh, is, is the harbor that I want to get to. So I know, I don't really know the beginning, but I know the thing that's going to set the story in motion, which is going to be Sheldon suddenly in charge of a little boy he wants to save. And it's going to go that way. And by the time I get to the end, something's going to happen with the little boy. I really didn't know what it was. And I knew that he was going to reach some kind of state of grace in dealing with the loss or death of his own son. This was going to be a personal journey that he, Sheldon was going to take, and the story was about him, and it's a biopic, really. And it was going to be interesting and driving. Things happen to Sheldon, and Sheldon and, and the world, and Sheldon makes things happen in the world, which is more to the point, throughout the story. There, I'm not going to ruin the book if you haven't read it, but there's things involving him checking into a hotel. There's things about him fighting in Korea. There's things about him riding a tractor, dressing up a little boy in an outfit. and it's all, I didn't know any of that when I started writing. I didn't put that on a piece of paper and start um, and, and figure out which of those moments were going to take place. I didn't know he was going to meet the hunters at the end. I didn't know I didn't know how Rhea and Lars were going to evolve as characters. I didn't know how Sigrid, I didn't even know Sigrid existed. She was the uh, she's the she's the cop. She ended up becoming so central and so much fun and because she had such a dry sense of humor and way about her um that I, I i gave her her own novel in american by day which i i loved writing in fact it's probably the book that i had the most fun writing american by day uh american by day for another 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 time so all of this is to say i did not plot out the novel what i did though is i had themes ideas personal uh uh, uh aspirations to improve as a writer a kind of, uh, I chose, in a sense, I didn't choose the crime drama, but I chose the basic model of a crime and save the boy because I knew that in the past I was trying to write novels the way that Dave Brubeck was trying to play jazz, right? Messing around with time signatures and, and you know, I don't even remember what Blue Rondo Ataturk is written in. It's like like in five nine time or something like that. It's not in four four time. And uh, and I wasn't good enough. I wasn't good enough to pull it off yet as a writer. So this time I wanted to go to the. I was going to use the blues. It wasn't really a crime novel. I was going with the blues. Three chords, twelve bars. Just m m deliver the goods. Right? Because within there, within that variation, you've got B.B. King, you've got Eric Clapton, and they do not play alike, but they're both playing the blues, and they're both very, very good. Right? Muddy Waters, or, or, or Robert Johnson, or, uh, or, or, or Nathaniel Radcliffe, or Stevie Ray Vaughan, right? Stevie Ray Vaughan versus, here's one, Stevie Ray Vaughan versus Hendrix, both playing Voodoo Child. If you haven't listened to one next to the other, you ought to. It's a life-changing experience. Voodoo Child, Hendrix, and then Stevie Ray Vaughan. They're both masterpieces, and they're both incredibly different. Even liking one more than another seems reductionist and irrelevant. They're brilliant, but they're totally, totally different. Same song. Same song. So the thing is, is that you can, even with three chords, 12 bars, uh, and the same melody, you can end up with tremendously exciting artistic variation. So with Norwegian by Night, blues, save the boy, but the second one of reconcile the fact that you couldn't save the other one. So those two things are working together. That's what made it literary. And then an improvisation, an, 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 art, an, 
a, a, a total improvisation between port point of departure and point of arrival. Although I did know the point of arrival, uh, ultimately. That, all of that bundled together gave me the theoretical structure and sufficient clarity of purpose to just do what Nora Roberts says. She's one of the most prolific romance writers on earth. I haven't read her, but I have deep respect for one key thing that she says all the time, which is to be a writer, ass in chair. And that was it. I had what I needed. I put my ass in the chair and I got started. That's how I went from dealt with the plotting, not plotting problematic of Norwegian by night. 20 minutes, 21 minutes. It's not, not bad. You, I'm verbose, but I edit very well. Not videos though. Bye.